Hello and welcome to the Field Guides. I'm Bill and I'm here with Daniel. Hello Daniel. Hello Bill, how are you doing today? I'm great and I'm here with Dr. LaPointe. Hey guys, good morning. And what we're going to do today and over the course of many future episodes is give you the idea of what it's like to be in the woods, in the field, and on the trail. Each month we pick a natural history topic, research the science behind that topic, and then take you out to a natural spot and share with you everything we've learned. And Today we're going to be doing an interview, which we normally don't do, <laughs> but our last episode that we recorded, the Fisher episode, got us so interested in these amazing carnivores that we wanted to find out more information from someone who actually knows about fishers rather than us. <laughs> so we've driven out here to Cornwall, New York in eastern New York State. Are we officially in the Catskill Mountains or just south? Uh, just south, Hudson just south. Valley. All right, so we are in the Hudson Valley Highlands, right? Yeah, correct. And Dr. LaPointe, who is the research scientist here, I got that right? Uh, director of research now, <laughs> All so right. super wow. fancy title well, Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Nice. It basically means I can't be in the field doing this as much anymore. <laughs> oh. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. Oh, we got some. Oh, ring neck. Uh, ring neck snake. There's a little ring neck snake along the forest road here. Look at all the kinks on the body right there. Yeah. Wow. He is getting some sun. Gorgeous. So these guys, for those that don't know, these are on the smaller side, what would you say, about 10, 12 inches? Yeah, maybe 12 inches. 12 yeah. inches. Yeah. And they have a very noticeable white ring around the neck. Uh, this guy is mostly kind of grayish. <laughs> now, is this the one where you lift it up and its belly will be all red? I don't think so. No, I don't no. think for this species. Is that what I'm thinking of? The yeah. Red belly? My dad called them red-bellied racers. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> get across the road, buddy. It's always a no good traffic distraction. coming today. So. <laughs> All right. So, Dr. Anywho, LaPointe, yeah. I'm yeah. going to throw it over to you, and if you could give the audience a quick overview of your background, how you ended up here, and then what happens here at Black Rock Forest. Yeah, sure. Um, man, how long do we have here? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, I'm from upstate New York. Like uh, a lot of the folks that come here come from New York City. So just to be clear, this is not upstate New York. Uh, I'm from proper upstate New York. <clears throat> and so like, you know, grew up basically as a mechanic. Went to undergrad at Paul Smith's College for hey. uh, natural resource policy and management. Thought I wanted to be an environmental lawyer. <laughs> Got offered a, a job with the WCS back with uh, 2001. What's the with Roland Case, Wildlife Conservation Society, oh, okay. to basically be a field tech. And from that point on, basically, it was I realized, hey, I could hang out in the woods and pick up coyote poop and <laughs> check cameras and do all this other cool stuff and get paid. So that was a kind of a game changer for me. Uh, eventually worked with Roland Case, Justina Ray, Matt Gomper, a couple other awesome mentors. Went off, did a master's at SUNY ESF, did some field telemetry in Northern California where I really tried to become an expert in how to do that. Came back to New York, Albany, New York State Museum, back with Roland Case to do my PhD on fisher movement behavior around Albany. Then was basically a PhD student enrolled in a German university, University of Konstanz. <laughs> uh, actually, trying to remember, my actual advisor on paper was the director of the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology. Oh. So now I was the carnivore guy at a bird institute. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that worked out really well. That was awesome. And that's another excellent uh, fortunate event for me in my life. Did, did a, a postdoc there on skull morphology and weasels. Um, oh, yeah. a, We're gonna talk about that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, still, I still don't really believe it. <laughs> but um, uh, so did that there for like two years. Did a postdoc down at um, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University, working on uh, golden eagle migration. Wow. And then was literally there doing my job when across the hallway was at the time the board president for where I'm now at Black Rock Forest, who said. Um, who had taken a call and he just I just remember looking at him he said yeah I know a guy who might be interested and and basically this organization Black Rock Forest was interested in um, fisher ecology and connectivity and I just happened to be sitting at the right place at the right time proposed the project for at the time the executive director here and here we are wow. five or six years later <laughs> I think you know so that career path bounce bounces around not always linear 
So That's here we are. Oftentimes, how it happens. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And here we are. Right, right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah. So for the audience out there, if you don't know what a fisher is, we're talking about uh, a big weasel, a big carnivore, and you should go listen to our fisher episode before you listen to this one. But I'd also just ask you, can you just give people a quick idea of who Roland Kays is? And I need to apologize because in the last episode, I mentioned him and I mispronounced his name. Oh. I called him Roland Keys, <laughs> which I'm horrified that I did. <laughs> yeah, well, he hasn't called in, right? So. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> he's probably too nice. But, but So he's a big mammalogist like here on the East Coast, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've worked with Roland on and off uh, well, 20 years now. Um, he's been a great figure in, in my research career. Uh, his expertise bounces around, but I think he's really popular for his kinkajou work in Panama. He's done some uh, other work across South America. He yeah. bounces all over. He does a lot of movement ecology stuff, a lot of camera trapping stuff. So, I mean, he's now, I think, the director of the biodiversity lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Yeah. So he's down there still doing cool stuff. I still, uh, I think the last paper that came out that I was a co-author on, he was also an author on. Wow. So we still email. I think he's in my inbox right now that I'm supposed <laughs> to respond to. So yeah, yeah. So Roland's been great. Always been a great uh, advisor. A lot of energy. Oh, yeah. I, I recommend if you guys haven't met him yet, you know, go down and I'm sure he's got some crazy stories. For Let's do podcast. it. Yeah. <laughs> Next time I go yeah. to North Carolina. <laughs> so on the way up here, folks, Daniel and I listened to uh, an episode that Dr. LaPointe did with Roland and his wild animals, right? Yes. Podcast. Yeah. And um, I was first introduced to him on the Rewilding Earth podcast, again, which if no one has listened to, I highly recommend that. And we're going to be talking about connectivity and, and big carnivores and how that ties into wild lands. And really, that's what rewilding Earth focuses on a lot. They're kind of following in the footsteps of people like Reed Noss and Michael Soule, all these conservation biologists that started the big work back in the 70s and 80s. Right. So, yeah. All right, so Black Rock Forest. Sure. Talk about what, what happens here. Well, we're a small nonprofit that operates largely kind of like a field station. And our goal is to better understand the natural world. We do this through three mechanisms three pillars of the foundation one would be research which i'm the director of and we have uh, two more education pillar and the conservation pillar so our education stuff is largely outdoor education environmental education our education programs often tie into our current research um, we bring a lot of kids up uh, from new york city locally etc and actually literally yesterday there's like 80 kids running around here and all being corralled by various instructors that we have on staff. And then we also have a conservation component where we do our best for invasive uh, species management. We're trying to be more like flood resilient and we're about to walk over some culverts that just got installed because back almost a year ago we got hammered with this like 100 year storm. We lost over close to two million dollars in damages and things oh, like wow. that. Holy cow. Yeah, so that's been an ongoing hurdle for us for about a year. but. You know, we're also trying to think about how to monitor and manage this forest so that it's more resilient. You know, we get all these old mature forests and then if you have too many deer, they're browsing everything down. So research goes into the management, which goes hopefully into the conservation and then feedback and all this stuff. Conservation opportunities provide research opportunities. Yeah. But so um, we tend to do a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm often kind of surprised that I think we're a staff of like 12 or something yeah, I was like looking this. Yeah, on the website. Yeah. So, we try to do a lot. We try to do it all well. That's obviously sometimes really difficult to do. So we're also a consortium, right? So what that basically means is we have a little bit of a social component where uh, institutions can pay an annual due to be a member, right? So for example, I mentioned Columbia University earlier. They are a member, so they pay a due every year and we facilitate their field research basically. And they also bring courses up sometimes and they'll do an overnight in some of our facilities and things like that. Oh, so, so we do a lot of internal stuff, but we also facilitate a lot of external stuff. So that's awesome. <laughs> we, so we might actually get, go, pot, go buy a couple of sites that, that um, others are doing active research on. So we'll Very see. Cool. Keep, Today so if you see like flagging and stuff, it's not all mine. Okay. okay. So. <laughs> you can take credit. You're the yeah. director of yeah. research. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah. So it's too I, modest. <laughs> I do have to commend you though, because looking on the website, I just thought it was so cool that like your summer camps you do here, yeah. you know, you hear about conservation organizations doing summer camp and they're doing great work, yeah. but you guys take it to like the next level because you're hooking these kids up with 
researchers. Yeah. They're like they're doing real science, like hard science. Yeah, yeah. So. We we definitely have like I I'm gonna probably struggle to come up with explicit examples, but oh, okay. I know like um we had uh what was it two summers ago, we've been working on this project trying to better understand road ecology and things like this. So I gave a little talk in a, a classroom of like I don't know, they're probably like 10 to 13 year olds. And it's like a STEM class, right? And I talked to them about it and I end my presentation with like, well, what, you know, what do we do about it? You know, we've got animals that need to move. We got roads and we need to move. We need our roads, at least for the time being, right? So what do we do about it? And that turns into like this STEM arts and crafts project. And literally they're all like building overpasses. Like uh, out of plastic and grass and all this other stuff. Oh, so, that's so cool. Yeah, so, cool. It's yeah. Awesome. so can you give us an example of like one of the, the research projects that might be happening here right now? Yeah, so we have a postdoc program. So currently we have a postdoc here, Hannah Makowski. Um, she's been here for about a year and she's looking at the genetic and environmental drivers of leaf phenology in trees. So a lot of people are familiar with, you know, <clears throat> peak fall and like when to come up and look and also like when do the leaves uh, bud out and things like this. She's trying to better understand how much of that is genetically fixed or which species or populations have the most variability. So as all, we all probably understand, wow. this changes in climate change are impacting like when things are spring is happening. So she's trying to better understand like what drives when these things turn red or when these things pop out. And, Very cool. And it's actually kind of funny because on my desktop this morning, we also do like volunteer programs that they, they you come in like citizen science they use their phones we actually have a specific trail for phenology so the volunteers come in they say like oh i saw this i saw this um it is the leaf out it's 100 percent or whatever and so that goes into nature's notebook and so i just pulled like four years of our data and it actually looks like our red maples are coming out earlier and earlier wow. so yeah Spring is here earlier and earlier. Yep. For the audience, what is phenology, just so they know? Oh, it's basically the study of the seasonal phenomena, it's like the timing of events, yeah. right? Yeah, when things happen out there. Yeah, yeah. So, not phrenology. <laughs> 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 it's one letter difference, yeah. but it's a big difference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So, that actually leads me to your research. Sure. Because a, a lot of the research that you've done and a lot of the research you're doing dealing with timing and crossing and there's a lot of stuff that we're interested in but one of the things that you said on a podcast that we listened to we mentioned in our, our last episode um, to know the land you talked about coyotes and we did an episode on um, coyotes and we talked a lot about sure. the eastern coyote and how some people think it needs to be a new species and how there's right. some debate there but that um, they've interbred with wolves and dogs mm -hmm. but you made kind of an offhanded comment that oh, I was no. like wait a minute and you made mention that snow depth may play a role in the fact that coyotes here in the east are larger right so i had never heard anything about that like is that something you could talk about a little bit <clears throat> yeah i can try i mean i'm definitely not a coyote expert and i think <laughs> that's there... okay we're not either <laughs> <laughs> i think there was a paper that came out a few years back i want to say it was paul jensen and others um and paul's at the dc they did a, a great effort in trying to better understand the, the interactions between like deer predation and coyotes and snow depth and snow characteristics. But I'm just gonna let you all go and read that at okay. some point yeah. and then I'll just try to make it up here on the spot, okay? <laughs> so I, I don't think it's a big stretch to imagine that snow depth would be a factor, right? So coyotes came from like the Southwest and the South, right? And so if you remember this like migration of coyotes into New York, they had to go up through Canada, right. right? And then come back down to the Adirondacks and then throughout the rest of New York. So the landscape difference is pretty significant, right? So you can imagine if you needed to survive, you would be better suited if you could cope with snow better. So personally, when you're out doing snow tracking, like we do every winter here, when you see changes in snow depth, it impacts everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and animals ability to move. And if you're a coyote and you have to find that food, if it, the snow is super deep, it's a problem for the deer, but if you can deal with it, I think that's to your advantage. Wow. And there may be, maybe there's some uh, issues having super long legs all summer, but I don't know what those are. <laughs> They're not as obvious. To me. Right, right. <laughs> but no, it's, I just love that, that fact and, and the fact that you said that just kind of opens up a whole area that I hadn't thought of before. And that's one thing that we are always finding on the podcast because we've mentioned this on Mike before as an environmental educator, there's always, we're always stories that I shared and just sure. think, 
that's the way it is and it's kind of settled and <laughs> you know i've always thought that oh the wolves or the coyotes here in the east are larger because they interbred with wolves but i find it fascinating when it's like mm, it's not that simple there's probably multiple factors driving that yeah, I, yeah. i'm sure and I, i'm sure that well all right and go on another limb here <laughs> i Great. i would guess that the the wolves uh, would have been better suited to deal with the deep snow as well. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, there's reasons animals look the way they do. Right. right? And so, I mean, I don't know. I'm happy for someone to go and disprove me. I'll put it that <laughs> way. And, and what you said about like the, this notion of like, well, it's in the paper, it's in the book. That's the way it is. Ugh. Right. No way. <laughs> no way. Well, and that's the beautiful thing about science yeah. though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, a, it's a gradual, gradual steps toward the truth. Yes. Right? Yeah. We're probably never going to get there, but yeah. no. Yeah. But it's a fun journey. So that leads me to my next question, because I read a, a paper that you did in 2015. Um, Mesopredator release fa facilitates mm. range expansion in Fisher. And my big question from that, I'm hoping you can answer this with authority. Is it mesopredator or mesopredator? <laughs> I, I would, I'm very interested in this as well. Oh, oh man, now I'm really on the spot. I always call it mezzo. I always said that too. Okay, but, I, but there's probably someone, if not thousands of people right now that are cringing. Right. right? So it's like, they're yeah, sorry. They're screaming at their radios. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Punch in the air. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, but seriously, in that paper, you mentioned about how fishers are growing larger as they expanded to the east. So can, can you talk about that paper a little bit for the audience? Yeah, sure. So that was a, a fun paper that became kind of a labor of love because it started as one thing and it just evolved over numerous iterations. It got rejected so many times. And eventually, like the thing we ended with at the end was nothing like what it started with. So that's like a little lesson in like <laughs> writing papers. But in short, yeah, we tried grabbing like all these different data sets that we hoped would eventually tell us a story. And the story ended up getting kind of complicated. So we were looking at like skull size, you know, to, to get like this really objective measure of like body size, right? Unfortunately, a lot of people will re report mass. And it's like, well, when you're dealing with a, you know, a one kilo animal and it just had a big meal, is it now 1.2 kilos? Yeah, you know, like yeah. stuff like that. So we tried sticking with skull size because presumably that's not changing. Although like fast forward to eventually we talk about Daniel's phenomenon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, we've got sc uh, skull size. We started looking at diet, um, which is also, you know, you're, you're combing all the literature to figure out what they're eating and how they measure it. And then there's a, um, we looked at species, uh, possible predation events on fishers, right? So not exactly competition with fishers, but what's killing fishers, right? And we stuck with like a, a mammalian carnivores, basically. So that was wolves, wolverines, mountain lions, bobcat, lynx, maybe coyote, black bear. I don't know. I can't remember. How long ago was this? 2015. Was like 10 years ago. 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah. That's I can't remember out. any of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, we tried to pull all these together and try and understand what was going on. And one thing we did see was that on average, the farther east you went, so like California, closer to uh, New England, Fisher skull size was a little bit bigger. Why? I'm not exactly sure why. Um, they just are. Maybe it's that snow thing again. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> and so there's that. There's also just like all these numerous factors that go into like why you should be a certain size. But these larger fishers also tended to eat, their diets were composed of larger prey. Now, I don't know if skull size changing just like a small fraction is really going to facilitate them eating much bigger things or if it's the other way around there's bigger things that are available and so they're better suited if they are bigger and or they can grow bigger because there's more resources i don't know right. it's chicken or egg i don't know i'm sure there's someone again who can answer this question for us <laughs> um but then it's kind of like like I'll, I'll fast forward and skim to the part that was my favorite and i still think about a lot is that in doing this paper we found very very few records of anything eating adult fishers like it was like uh i think like there was a paper on wolf diet or some wolf ecology and they're like we found a wolf that killed a fisher and you're like oh all right we'll write that there's one, down. one. <laughs> yeah exactly and i think there was some work in maine that had um been radio where were foot trapping lynx to put radio collars on them, and they found a few links that had been killed by fishers. And of course, you know, it's a fisher versus a three-legged link. Yeah. You know? So it's a bit of an advantage, right? You mentioned that one on our podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, that stuff's crazy to me. But the, the thing that was kind of consistent were bobcats and fishers, and somehow I'm still sort of like playing in this little realm where fishers 
in the East Coast are killing bobcats. But out West, bobcats are the number one source of natural mortality for female fishers. So you have this like weird shift and maybe they all chit chat around the Mississippi and say like, all right, from now on, this is how we do right. this. But like out, out West, it's like, you know, mountain lions are the number one predator for um, male fishers, natural uh, mortality for male fishers, bobcats for female. And of course, females are half the size of the male fisher. Yeah. So, I personally think that's mind blowing and I would love to like get the, the bandwidth to do a project that really looks at Fisher Bobcat interaction and then maybe we can like parachute in porcupines and see how it all works <laughs> you out. You have time for all that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Come yeah. On, Wait, man. Well, let's go, let's go <laughs> to the next. Yeah. So the next question, I think you should ask the next question. Maybe we'll cut this out because this is not a question we prepped sure. you on, but Daniel yeah. and I were talking to this on the way up because I mentioned your study about, you know, fishers getting larger as they move west and maybe it has to do with the prey. And that brought up something about Yellowstone. So yeah, so we were learning that the molly pack in Yellowstone is larger on average, and that their ah. prey is bison. They prey heavily on bison, and ah. that that potentially is correlated. And I was trying to think from like an evolution standpoint how that would make sense. Is it that the smaller wolves are unable to hunt bison, so that they die, and the larger ones are the ones that pass on their genes? But for that to happen in just a handful of generations doesn't make any sense yeah. to me. So then, is it a question of well, maybe there's higher nutrient quality in bison, so then that's allowing them to grow bigger. So you're wondering if maybe that for the fisher with having bigger prey, if there's any kind of correlation like that as well. But yeah, who so, knows? Yeah, my first guess, and it's literally a guess, um, <laughs> would be that I agree with Daniel and that it's probably too soon to, yeah. to, like, to see uh, uh, an impact like that. But, I mean, I've been proven wrong a lot. Um, <laughs> But I think there probably is something to be said about what the available prey and who can capitalize on it. And you know, if n no one else is capitalizing on these big piles of you know roaming protein, someone or something is going to, right? So they start to fill that niche, um, and that's how you can get so many different size predators, carnivores in such a small area. Right. You know, they're all specializing in something. Somebody has to fill the niche. Do you remember, because I don't remember from Doug Smith who ran the wolf project out there. Yep. He recently came and spoke in Buffalo. And um, do you remember, were the mollies just feeding on bison in the winter or was it all year long? I think it was all year long, but most That's definitely crazy. more so in the winter. Yeah, yeah. Wolves, that crazy. But I mean, I don't know, that could be totally wrong. <laughs> I just, I feel like that's what I remember hearing, but yeah. yeah. That's crazy though, that wolves can take down bison. Yeah, I imagine it's yeah. way easier in the winter with the snow depth being their advantage. So that's kind of a correlation Still. with the coyote. Thing. <gasps> oh yeah, 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 for sure. It's not. It's there were like I'm five of try. us. I wouldn't want to try to, try to take down <laughs> yeah, a bison. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I've seen enough uh, stuff on YouTube about exactly. why, why it should not do that. Yeah, yeah. Just don't mess with the bison, right? Yeah. <laughs> Public People never learn. Yeah, yeah, PSA. Right? They will yeah, yeah. never learn. No matter how many tourists get gored. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about um, mesopredator release a little more. So, sure. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I've always learned and taught people that mesopredator release is when you remove the top predators from an area, then those middle level, level predators, their populations are released and they usually um, explode sure. or definitely increase at least. Because in our episode, we touched on the idea, and I think this is something that I sent you, that when fishers are, with the range is expanding, you know, we run in to people that kind of are one of two minds about it where, hmm. hey, we don't want another predator in this area. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be bad for prey populations that hunters are, are trying to find. Or you get people that just think, hey, uh, another species that's going to increase biodiversity, that's great. But, you know, we typically find that, well, there's going to be pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. it's, sure. Ecology is such a gray area. It's going to be complicated. <laughs> that's why we have statistics. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> What's that about lies and statistics, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, in your experience with fishers, you know, obviously they're going to be able to take down slightly larger prey, as you've already mentioned. So that's going to impact certain populations. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm interested in, in just hearing about like, what are some positive and negative impacts that fishers range expansion is going to have on various species? You know? Right. So I am incredibly biased. So I'm just going to flat out say there's no disadvantage to having more <laughs> fishers. No, but, but Hear seriously, that everybody? <laughs> Hear that? Uh, don't email me, uh, but, uh, dear idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, seriously, I think the, the frame of mind that I try to keep is what we should have, right? right. Like this, 
what did we have beforehand? And like the yeah. fishers were like basically, you know, eliminated. So they were here, we, they're extirpated. They're coming back in a lot of places. To me, for as an ecologist, but also as like a, a human, I find that exciting, right? Yeah. So it's more of that balance returning. We're moving closer to ecological wholeness. Yes. Even though yeah, we, yeah. we'll probably never get there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, moving yeah. it back towards that direction. Is yeah, yeah, cool. that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> yes, yes, That's next episode, right? <laughs> but, um, so I think we have a native predator coming back. That's going to change some components of the landscape, right? So what are those components? Well, their primary diets, small mammals mostly, right? And sure, they'll take a rabbit. Sure, they'll t tackle a porcupine if they have to, but- And children. Yeah, small <laughs> children left unattended. Yeah, in school grounds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, th thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, <laughs> but- um, You did the same thing with the Florida Panther one. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's never happened with the Florida Pumas. <laughs> Yeah, who needs data? Daniel, That's right. who needs data? But so I, I think you know the fishers are going to come back and, and and they're going to hit small mammals. When I was doing my work in around Albany, that was such a bizarre landscape to study such a quote unquote rare right. carnivore, right? Like you know what are they doing in suburbia? That didn't make sense. But as we were up there doing this stuff, eventually people would hear about it and you know whatever, and they would reach out or you'd get an email or someone would Google fishers and like you know, questions and they'd come to us and they would tell us the story like, well, I was sitting in my kitchen table and I was watching the bird feeder and the gray squirrel was sitting there in the apple tree branch. And I saw this thing that now I know is a fisher, just that it came to the bird feeder. It looked up, it saw the squirrel. The squirrel didn't really change any behavior. The fisher went to the tree, climbed the tree, grabbed the squirrel, went down. And, and uh, I'm sitting there on the phone like, Oh, that's amazing like that yeah. i can't believe you got to see that like I yeah. do, i'm like trying to hold my excitement so i don't sound like a psycho <laughs> but cool. yeah yeah but like he just said and eventually this uh yes uh bird watcher eventually just said yeah it kind of looked like he was just grocery shopping <laughs> and, I, and i thought like yeah and then you know, like to, to get back to your question it's like we have a lot of species that have not had to deal with fishers that historically yeah. would have right, right? so like anyone that does bird feeding in their backyard in suburbia or like around Cornwall, a lot of folks have homes that are right adjacent to Black Rock Forest. So everything that's in Black Rock Forest is, you know, possibly going to head in your backyard. So everyone that puts a bird feeder out rages war against gray squirrels. I'm like, yeah. well, maybe if you had some fishers, <laughs> you know, but then not super receptive. Natural to that deterrent. Idea. Better yeah. than buying a squirrel yeah. baffle for a hundred bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I, I mean, you know disadvantages to having fishers i mean they're going to compete with a couple other things but fishers being semi-arboreal it gives them a whole new like uh access a whole new niche that like the red fox the gray fox the other weasels aren't really doing bobcats aren't really going to like have to deal with fishers consuming all of their prey yeah. there's probably a few species like personally if we had uh, fishers here in black rock forest like i would imagine that 60 to 70 percent of their diet's going to be gray squirrel yeah um we no have plenty of, of them yeah, yeah no shortage of squirrels and um no offense to the squirrel biologists out there but i don't think they're high on the list of like we have to save the squirrel <laughs> i'm uh, offended <laughs> <laughs> i can tell as i was saying i could see in your face so you're like, uh, it's getting red yeah, yeah um so i i i don't think there's going to be much that necessarily suffers i i have heard you know uh well there's a four-legged animal that people are very fond of that people often jam their hands up in the air. I'm not going to mention it by name, but there's also like, I have an idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> but um, there's also like a, a small fraction of folks who are interested in the birds, right? And so like, oh, fishers, they're going to come up and decimate all the songbirds. I'm like, ah, not really. Even when you look at the studies and stuff, you know, a lot of fishers that are out there, a lot of populations, they have a diverse diet, but it's not like they're going around hammering every bird nest out there. And yeah. even, you know, the ground nesting birds, you know, it's like, I don't know. I haven't seen a bunch of evidence of it. Okay. Yeah, all the dietary studies that we looked at for our episode on the fisher, none of them suggested heavy predation on no. any kind of bird, but, alone no. turkeys or And I think that's else. what really led me to that question because I know uh, when I first learned about mesopredator release, one of the impacts of that was mm -hmm. decreased understory bird abundance. Hmm. Um, but that may have to do with other 
meso predators besides fishers. Sure. Yeah. Cause, foxes, coyotes. Yeah, yeah I was going to pin it on foxes, but I'm glad you did. Yeah. I don't want I don't want my friends calling and saying like, "Hey, I, th- I heard you throw shade at my fox." <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good reputation, so attack me, not him. <laughs> but especially gray foxes. I mean, they're arboreal and yeah. you know, spend a lot of time in the trees. So, yeah, yeah it would make sense. That's yeah, I, 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 I mean, that's another whole podcast. Gray fox are amazing. We even oh, had yeah. a grad student here, Anna Sikorsi, came from Columbia University to do a bunch of gray fox work. And I think we need to do a ton more on gray fox. It's, it's like we can't find them right. anymore. And when we do find them, they're in the city of Newburgh. You're like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Have you ever seen one? Yes. Yeah, really? They're, yeah. they're, I've seen one once. They're seen gorgeous. a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I just don't understand, like, this, like, gorgeous animal that it's so quirky and interesting and small. Or it gets picked on by the other canids. It can <laughs> climb trees. Yeah. It's like this cool animal. But it seems to be, like, I wouldn't say, I don't want to exaggerate, say disappearing. But it's like, where the hell are they? Yeah. 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 I just got a video of one on the trail cam I put up behind my parents' house. Nice. Oh, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Cool. cool. Where's that? On Depew. Okay. Yeah. So, so the suburb hell, of Buffalo. Yeah, where the hell is Depew? Yeah. Suburbs. Yeah. Suburbs of Buffalo. Yeah, about okay, maybe like right. 10, 15 minutes outside okay. of the city. And can you give us your yeah. physical address too? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mom and Dad. <laughs> You're going to show up. Wow. So that leads us to a question that we talked quite a bit about in the last episode. Yeah. And people have brought up with me personally several times since hearing the episode is, are fishers impacting turkeys? And last night when we were listening to your episode um, with Dr. Kays, it was funny because at one point you guys did talk about finding an eyeball inside a, a fisher's stomach. Do you remember that? Yeah. And it was I, a... T- how can you not remember <laughs> that? Right. Yeah. It, well, that it was, was funny, a turkey. There... Daniel and I both looked at each other <laughs> like... <laughs> it's like we found an eyeball and I was like, it's going to be a turkey. Watch, like jokingly. And they're like, yeah, it was a turkey. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. So wow. I guess if, if we have friends or our hunters say to us, oh, we hate fishers. They're killing all the turkeys. What do we say? Nah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Love it. Uh, no, I mean, again, it's like, you know, there, first of all, there's not a lot of diet studies done on fishers, right? And a lot of them that have been done were done as like carcass, um, like, you know, fur trappers or whatever through a state program, right? So you collect them, you do stomach contests, etc. There's a ton of challenges with diet studies. Like, it ate that that one time. Did it actually prey on it? Or was it a roadkill turkey on the mm-hmm. side of the road? You know, kind of thing. Fishers aren't, like, averse to, like, going up to a road and eating roadkill. I yeah, mean, they're, 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 not, a lot of they're, not, they're definitely not. Daniel's not either. Super shy. Yeah, yeah hey, man. There's, there's, there's books on that, too. Groceries are expensive now, man. Groceries yeah. are expensive Thanks, now. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's not go there. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I think like there's a lot that plays into like turkeys and as far as I'm aware is I don't think turkey populations are suffering. They were almost gone. Right. And now we haven't had turkeys in this forest in like since this forest has existed as an organization, which is like a hundred years. Wow. And wow. we're getting them in the last couple of years. And there's not many. There's like a, a, a little a brood that's like four or five individuals, but they're popping up and you know, there's no fishers in here either, so maybe that's why we have turkeys, because we don't have this nasty animal going around shaking all their eggs and eating them. But, yeah. but uh, um, I'm skeptical. I'll put it that way. But I think I always have to be skeptical. Right. And For so sure. there's tons of things that could eat a big, tasty egg sitting on the ground. Right. I've seen videos of foxes raiding their nests sure. again. And doing <laughs> the yeah, those fox. <laughs> Suddenly it became an anti-fox yeah, yeah, yeah. episode. Yeah. Yeah. But as we're talking, I'm thinking, it seems like as turkeys are becoming more common, you know, across yeah. the landscape here in New York State, fishers' range is also expanding. Sure. So if fishers were feeding heavily on turkey, you wouldn't think that those two things would be happening simultaneously. It, yeah. That's my armchair ecologist. Yeah, thing. you know, that's better than <laughs> mine. Good job, Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, there's, th- I mean, like you said earlier, like ecology is full of this gray area, and there's so much that, there's only so far we can infer and like stand on a podcast or in front of a room and you know and, and claim it's the other thing right like we still have people that if i go and give a public talk there's almost inevitably that person in the back of the room at the end of the talk that comes up with a very personal like account of what happened to them with a yeah. fisher and i'm like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean that's happening everywhere all the time. Right. Like you may have witnessed this happen, but it doesn't mean that's a big thing. You may the, have witnessed something that's infrequent. The plural of anecdote is not data. Right. Oh yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Is that in your email signature? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It should be. Right. <laughs> I can't. I can't claim credit for that. I heard that somewhere along the way. Yeah. But 
that that leads me leads me to my next question. I was thinking about you've mentioned a couple of times, and you were clear to let us know that fishers are not here in Black Rock Forest. Yeah, yeah. So, do you have any idea why that is? Like, this oh, seems boy. like it'd be great habitat, you know? Yeah. So, how much time we have left? <laughs> uh, so, if you would like drop me into this forest, and I didn't know how I got here, one of the first things I can see about the forest that I do almost reactively now is I look for tree cavities. Yeah. If you guys look around, there's not a ton of tree cavities right. and specific kinds. So it's like this oval shape. If you cup your two hands together and you give yourself two inches between your fingers, that's about what you're looking for, which if you're a birder, that's about what a pileated woodpecker cavity looks like, right? So you I, I just start looking around at trees and I'm like, you know, we got, you know, this, this over here was probably harvested at some point 40 or 60 years ago. But even over here, there's plenty of trees that are over there that are big enough and old enough to have cavities. We don't have a bunch. And so when I first came here and first got the tour, when I was thinking about coming and working here, I asked, hey, when was the last time you saw a fisher here? And they're like, 2015. And this was in 2018. So I thought, oh, okay. So they're probably coming by just not often they're recolonizing that's awesome but i'm not sure that we have the female denning cavities that are specific enough for a, a sustaining population so that's my first like huh we don't have fishers in here even though they've been spotted in here just a couple of times in the last hundred years so the other thing is that they were extirpated, which means they all have to come back. Now, if you zoom out and start looking at the landscape, all right, so maybe the microhabitat's not perfect for fishers. Although I would have said that about suburban Albany too. Right. <laughs> but if you go around suburban Albany, all those places, a lot of suburbia that doesn't get developed, doesn't get developed because it's a ravine. It's a, you know, some nasty spot where it's too expensive to develop. And that's where all the old trees are. Oh. And those big old trees have big old cavities now. So, Fishers are doing fine in there. But here, we zoom out and we're like, all right, maybe there's something that they're not quite happy about. I don't know. But then it's like, well, how are they getting in here? If they wanted to be here, how would they get here? So you zoom out and then it becomes kind of obvious. We've got the Hudson River to our east. It's pretty big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess things could swim it, but they'd have to start in like Kingston and start swimming west and then eventually get across, right? You know, the current's going to drag them all the way That's a down. long swim for a fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the north of us, we have the city of Newburgh and then Interstate 84 going east-west. And then to our west, we've got Interstate 87. It gets something like 50,000 cars a day. And then to the south, we have this awesome green span. It includes West Point Military Reservation, Harriman State Park, Bear Mountain State Park, etc. So we have the space. But the barriers are kind of pretty obvious. Now, fishers are related to weasels. Anyone who has a pet ferret knows that those things aren't exactly averse to like going through tunnels and things like this. So you would think with highways nearby, as long as there's drainage culverts, fishers ought to be able to use them. And we found them using them regularly to get from forest fragment to forest fragment, like up in Albany. But for some reason down here, they don't seem super excited to be crossing all these barriers. City of Newburgh, a little treacherous. We've run camera traps around the city, every little forest patch where you can think where if you put a camera, it won't get triggered by people or cars. And then, um, you know, the Hudson, we're not super worried about it. There's nothing we're gonna fix over there, I think. But trying to look at Interstate 87 to the west of us, trying to understand how animals react to it, whether they approach it, whether they cross it, when they do, where, you know, how often do they have to try before they make it, do they make it, all these sorts of things. We have a couple fishers just west of 87 on Scunamunk Mountain State Park. I say a couple because like we run cameras every year, we just finished a six year, and I wouldn't say they're uniquely identifiable, but when you get a female, an adult female at the same camera at the same spot every year, they do have some coloration, you can tell. So they're nearby. I guess if you don't have to cross a four lane highway that gets a car like every two seconds or less than every two why seconds, would why would you try? Right. I'm sure when they're up on Skundamunk, they can see us, you know? So <laughs> if, if there's any like, um, hey, what's over there? Yeah. I mean, you would think they would give it a try, but... Maybe they I, do and they're just like, yeah, there's no holes here. Yeah, <laughs> or... Think, as time goes on, as this forest ages, and just as you know, the, the tiny chances of them crossing increase with time. 
Yeah. Uh, do you think eventually they'll be here? I, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so like, I actually think they'll be here anytime now. Yeah. So I'm actually kind of excited to be here. And so I have to, I, I push a little bit to, to run cameras every year and do field work because I want to be here when they settle here. Right. So yeah. I had mentioned maybe earlier that in 2015, they got a, was the last time they saw a fisher. It was on a camera trap that one of the educator was running for class. And I don't remember if they baited or anything. It just happened to be a male fisher walked in front of the camera. And lo and behold, that had happened in 2013 too. So there was two instances where two different fishers, I think one was a female, one was a male, just popped up once, just passing through. And I think the problem is, is they're territorial. Mm -hmm. So they're that, it's the textbook phenomenon of reintroduction and recolonization, where if you drop a territorial animal off into a new place, its natural behavior is to find boundaries, often other individuals. So they're, they're smelling, they're looking for the territorial male to say, get out, turn around, you know, things like this, or the Hudson or, or whatever, I don't know, somebody's car. So I think those two individuals came over, pioneers, so to speak, <laughs> and then came here and just kept going and going and going. And like, you know, eventually no one knows what happened. There's no fur harvest records of those two individuals from the DEC. And you can legally trap them, not here in Black Rock Forest, but anywhere outside, you can yeah. legally harvest them according to the DEC. So I think, yeah, I, Daniel, I think they're literally knocking at the door. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think it's a matter of time and you know again i'd love to catch that one or two that crosses and throw a gps collar on and say all right now where you know yeah, let's yeah. see what happens because oh, it's it is a super cool ecological phenomenon of this dispersal and where do you go yeah. you're naive how do you know where to go when do you turn right when do you turn left do you live survive what <laughs> happens you know it's like it's plot thickens but like, <laughs> I, I think it would be a, a cool study to do and then we can throw in the bobcat and the porcupine actually we don't have any porcupines yeah. so we'd have to get porcupines to oh yeah yeah really? yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. plenty of bobcat wow. oh yeah that's kind of my bread and butter at the moment great yeah, yeah. so i think that's a good point to to shift the conversation to talk about wildlife crossings sure um, and we can share with the, the audience that here in new york state we actually have had good news yeah. Um, just last month, New York State passed the Wildlife Crossings Bill. So it's encouraging our state Department of Transportation basically to look at all of our highways, parkways, throughway, to look at where wildlife crossings would yeah. be beneficial. And they're going to establish a top 10 list. And then it's going to allow New York State to access millions of dollars that were made available with the recently passed infrastructure, federal infrastructure right. act. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been doing connectivity this road stuff for my master well my first gig out of uh, undergrad was a subcontract for the wildlife conservation society to put cameras under interstate 87 i think i was like 22 or something like that so it was forever ago it was my first publication actually you know so i've been doing this for a long time and it's it, the field that you know i'm kind of a cup half empty person anyone who knows me and listening was like oh yeah definitely but um <laughs> uh so doing this stuff i'm always a little bit depressed right it's like all right we've got roads and animals and those don't come they don't add up very well it's never good for the animals um there's lots of other issues but for like the first time that i can remember i've been kind of excited which is <laughs> really great. weird for me right wow. it's uh, weird for a conservationist <laughs> yeah, yeah, right yeah, 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 <laughs> to yeah. feel that it, way it's like wow maybe something's happening you know, <laughs> is it, i'm having a little moment here right yeah. <laughs> but like um so yeah, the infrastructure bill launched this wildlife crossing pilot program. Again, thanks Biden. Yeah, 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 yeah thanks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was that, like 350 million over yeah. four years or something. They just actually released the new um, notice of funding opportunity. Like the new round is opening up, deadline September 4th. I think, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to be involved in an application for that. So that's awesome. So that, that funding is sitting there earmarked for wildlife crossing stuff, whether it's New York State who needs some sort of plan on how to even quantify where the problems are, let alone try to mitigate that, or if you want to go and build a, a whole overpass somewhere. So it's sitting there, it's not being used for anything else. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, or if you're a state agency, the money's there. So at the New York State level, we've got the wildlife, what is it called, the New York State Crossing Bill, right? I think it's been passed by the state Senate and assembly and it's on its way to Hochul's desk. Right. Right. So it's not like it hasn't happened yet, 
but hopefully fingers are crossed i hope she signs off on it and if so like what you were saying before basically it gives our state transportation agencies the mechanisms to start looking into this further than what they already have so that opens up the door for them to be able to initiate their own projects if they want to collect data they can work with folks like me who have data on roadkill and where crossing structures might be needed and things like that so it's sort of like this impetus to say like, hey, we should probably try to organize ourselves at the statewide level. Because all of our neighbors have one, I believe. Basically all of the other states, a lot of states have it. So I, it, it doesn't come with funding for them, but at the same time, if this becomes a thing, there's this NOFO for the federal program ends in September and it'll be, there's another round next year. So oh. it would literally be an opportunity for the state to say, hey, we need to make a plan we have legislation that says so and then apply to the federal program for a couple million or whatever they think wow. they need to actually produce this plan Make it i think it's an awesome opportunity yeah. i'm i'm pretty excited you shouldn't miss this wow good news yeah yeah good news <laughs> like this might actually happen yeah, yeah. Sweet. and i feel like we should mention just kind of big picture that the wildlife crossings act isn't just about wildlife benefiting it's also for public safety yeah. uh, because Absolutely. And that's, I think that's a big part of it being pushed through too, is obviously you have wildlife crossing the roads, there's going to be collisions, there's going to be injuries and even deaths from, from that happening, yep. especially with, you know, we got more than a few deer around. So yeah. yeah excellent point. And something that I definitely forget sometimes because of, because of the hat I'm wearing most yeah. of the time. Right. But I think I've seen numbers that show, that the average cost of a deer vehicle collision is like $4,000. And there's probably 70,000 of those accidents every year in New York. So the numbers add up pretty fast. And that doesn't include like the loss of human life and right. things like this, which are terrifying, or everything else other than deer, right? So yeah. it's definitely, I mean, it's a proven strategy. Yeah. You know, if you do it well, the numbers come down. And we can't afford not to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I like that. Man, he's full of good slogans. He's <laughs> <Yeah, yeah. It's laughs> very <Right>. quippy. <laughs> so yeah, the, the issue of con connectivity, though, um, we were just talking off mic about how it's becoming more of a buzzword. I don't know if you've heard, in Western New York, we have a group that we've done some episodes with, the Western New York Land Conservancy. Yeah, yeah. And they're creating the Western New York Wildway, trying yeah, yeah. to connect northern Pennsylvania with Lake Ontario. Yeah, yeah. And they're working with the Wildlands Network and really, Wildlands Network, folks, if you don't know about it, we'll put links in the episode notes. Yeah. Fantastic organization that is, serves as kind of an umbrella organization to connect groups all across the continent, trying to get groups to create wildways across the continent. So the, the names I mentioned before, Reed Noss, Michael Soule, they were instrumental in getting that whole project started. Yep. Come, kind of coming out of the ashes of Earth First and the uh, radical environmental movement. Sure. Um, which Daniel learned about in my wilderness class. Oh, <laughs> I don't remember, nice, though. I was nice. asleep half the time. <laughs> nice callback. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything like that going on in this end of the state that you know of? Well, I think you're standing in one of the Eastern Wildlands corridors right yeah. now, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's folks all over the place who are interested in connectivity, you know, organizations who want to do stuff. And, and everyone's kind of takes a slightly different approach. People are looking at from a map point of view and doing stuff in a GIS or something where they're trying to assign values to components of a landscape to try to predict where connectivity is or um, prioritize corridors like if you're a land trust maybe you can your role might be to have a, a map that helps you decide which parcels are highest on your priority right so there's stuff like that there's a little bit like what I try to do where um, you actually take the animal point of view, catch an animal, put a collar on it, ask it where it goes, and then from their movement decisions, go the other way and say like, all right, now based on everything you tell me what you like to do and don't like to do, now I can build a different kind of map. And hopefully those two things overlap, like yeah. this map version, you know, narrowing in versus the animal and, and narrowing and, and widening out. Um, but there's a, a lot of stuff like that, a lot of organizations you know, I got um, interviewed for a Spectrum News piece. They came to me because they were doing a story on what the folks out, out by you guys were doing. Oh, great. Yeah, it, it's a pretty exciting time and it makes sense to a lot of people. Even I think... in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it works down there. You're right, yeah, Florida yeah, Wildlife yeah. Corridor. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And, you know, and then there's like the big Wallace Annenberg Wildlife uh, Overpass out by LA. That's like this $100 million project that gets tons of press and publicity and 
from what I understand, it's all positive. There's all kinds of big movements and networks. I mean, you guys can probably list as many as I can. But um, the thing with the connectivity that I think helps is that it's not the super abstract concept. I can be on the soccer sidelines with one of my kids and talk to parents and they say, what do you do? And I tell them and like, I can tell them like, well, you know, I also try to figure out where will the deer cross the road and can we keep it off the road? And pretty much anyone that drives is like, that sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I like so, that. So like the concept's not too abstract. For right. People, yeah, it. they can wrap their head around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and I don't really know what the cost is. What, what's the harm? This isn't a cost, but it's actually a benefit and actually resonates with locally pretty high is like we have occasionally quote unquote nuisance wildlife and when they're bears they're also kind of dangerous wildlife right so we're standing at this northern tip of like this big long green space right and so bears are reproducing and they have to go somewhere so if you completely cut off this and turn it into a big green island bears are coming up to the edge of that island and that edge of that island is backyard and suburbia yeah so it's like well the animals that are going to be that nuisance are probably the ones who are sub-adults. Mom kicked them out because yep. she's got to make room for the next two. Dad wants nothing to do with you, so get out. And so the first place you go is to the edge, and there's a dumpster, and there's a garbage can. And I was talking to one landowner who was having an issue, literally asking me for advice on how to keep bears out of their trash. I was like, well, I don't have very good advice for that. And I totally tried to like pivot and segue to the connectivity. I said, well, what if we, instead of trying to figure out how to keep bears out of your garbage can, what if we tried to figure out how to keep them in the forest? And then it's like, well, there is this concept and we want to mitigate roads and things like this. And if the bears could just disperse, there's someone else's problem, right? So, <laughs> so, so it's like, I, I think- Keep passing I think, the buck. Yeah, 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 or the bear, whatever so the works. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I think, I think it works for people yeah. and it makes sense i think but again it benefits everybody yeah literally Man, everybody you guys are really good at this like, i need <laughs> well, to, i need to take lessons from you guys <laughs> just it just seems like a no-brainer it really does i don't know why we're on the ball today because <laughs> steve's not here <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> there you go. so but that you know you, you talk about how it it's easy for a lot of people to wrap their head around but then also at the next level you know to bring it back to how you talked about resilience i mean mm. connectivity Wildlife's going to need to move as the climate changes. Yeah. And if it has space to move, that's going to be beneficial too on, on sure. whole other levels and wildlife and flora and fauna that people might not even be thinking about for the most part, but are still so important. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally agree. And I think, like, I, I think when we talk to our neighbors, the, the, the person that's standing in the spot, it makes sense. But when you scale it up and it becomes something about like all the neighbors mm -hmm. or the town or the region, then it starts to become a little abstract. And that that's where this the Center for Large Landscape Conservation, the Wildland Networks, all these groups are out there doing this big scale stuff and becoming big organizations and doing so, like that becomes their role in trying to convince like the legislator or something that like, yeah, a lot of your constituents individually, they all like this, but I know it's gonna be kind of difficult to enact on New England but we need to be thinking about it. Yeah. So I, it, it, it's cool stuff. I don't know. We talk, you know, next podcast, you know. Okay. <laughs> next time we drive all the way out here. Yeah, next time you want to drive on the roads that are estimating <laughs> our animals, come on out here. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to be sure we touch on a phenomenon that I don't think a lot of people know about. I thought it was really cool when I first heard about it, and when I sent it to you, I, I feel foolish because I misspelled it. Um, oh. Danelle's phenomenon. Yeah, Denel's phenomenon. Denel. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I spell it, though. <laughs> D-E-H-N-E-L, I think. Yay, yeah, yeah, good job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell, can you explain that for the audience, what that's oh, all about? Oh, sure. We can try. <laughs> yeah. um, basically, this was a seasonal pattern that was described with skull size changes in shrews. It's named after uh, August Denel, uh, who's a Polish biologist, naturalist, who first observed this doing measurements, right? So basically why it's called a phenomenon is this idea that in the summer, the skull size, and when I say size, I don't mean like the whole freaking thing is getting gigantic, but it's mostly in the brain case in, in a carnivore or a shrew in particular, that brain part of the skull is way in the back. So it's a little more bulbous in the back. 
And then as summer wanes, fall enters, and then winter, it actually shrinks little. He described it by like 20% change and wow. shrink it right does it makes your brain hurt right <laughs> right like, like my head hurts a little thinking about oh you know 20 percent less of what's up here the thing i I'm got already, a small brain yeah i'm already struggling right <laughs> now right you know, it's like, and, and so like by winter it gets this super small size but then the crazy part is as spring comes back it gets bigger huh. so i'm i'm sitting at mox plank i'm finishing my phd and dina deckman a pi there is starting to talk about this and she had been talking about it for a long time and maybe i just kind of ignored her but then because <laughs> i was doing like carnivore stuff and she was interested in shrews and also had heard or had some reason maybe a conversation to believe that it happened in weasels too she was like hey I know you don't believe in this stuff, so, which is why I want to hire you to you know, nice. help me do this. That's a great and, and, approach. And I was very much like, no. <laughs> yeah, no but then, Never but, mind. Uh, Stupid yeah. approach. <laughs> yeah, no, no. no, but <laughs> okay. Dina, Dina was great. She felt very, very strongly. She was really passionate by this idea. She pursued it. She got funding for it. Hats off to Dina for doing this. And so basically, shrews are really difficult to work with. Super high metabolisms. If they go without food or water for like six or eight hours, they die. Yeah, they're like oh constantly like, starving to death. Oh, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're like insane little animals. I think they're the most voracious predator for mammals that's out there. On and, planet Earth, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're like these crazy little animals. You catch them in the little Sherman traps, you know, live trap or whatever. So normally what you do is you shake a small mammal out into like this bag or something, a pillow bag or something, and you get it in your hand and you scruff it, you know, by the back of the neck. You do that with a shrew, they'll probably die. die. Because oh. it's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's cool. I mean, they're, they're amazing little things. So they're a really difficult study animal. Now, weasels, like the small ones, Mustela armenia, like the short tail weasel, the ermine and stuff, or like least weasels, they're also a little bit like shrews, right? They're running around all the time, super high in metabolism, not a lot of capacity to store fat. So again, always looking for food. Um, so you would think that an animal that's stressed for energy might try to figure out a way to not be so stressed and figure out a way is evolve a strategy. So it's not crazy to imagine that if shrews are showing this weird seasonal pattern, it's definitely weird. This weird seasonal pattern, maybe weasels do it too. So that's when Dina came to me and she said, I have reason to believe that weasels might do this. And I'm like, eh, right. and I said, well, you know, eventually I was like, boy, shit, I really need a job. <laughs> uh, um, and um, wait, you're gonna pay me to go to all these museums around Europe? Hmm. <laughs> okay, All I'm in. Right. Yeah, for the sake of science, I'm <laughs> yes. in. But um, so we did this. We measured a bunch of skulls and uh, you know tried to control for like where the skulls came from, like Russia, Finland, Alaska, Michigan. We tried to get these skulls from museums from like all over the world. Always trying to make sure that we wanted this kind of extreme winter, right? So because if you were going to find it and you assume that it was based on resource availability in this extreme temperature stuff, it'd be in the worst conditions, yeah, right? Gotcha. So we, I, I forget, a thousand skulls or something like oh this. Oh my God. Take all these little measurements for your calipers and throw them in a plot and holy cow, they're doing this weird thing. And, um, <laughs> wow. and, and I, I remember like one of our first trips was to, um, I think we went to Bern, uh, uh, Switzerland to the museum. <sighs> And, um, Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, I know. It's a terrible time, <laughs> really. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it was on the way back. I was there with a PhD student, Javier uh, Lazaro, who authored a lot of the papers that came out of this. I think he was driving and I had the laptop and I was kind of like, dude, and just spun the laptop. And I was like, you know, well, to keep looking where we're going. But <laughs> I, I think there's a pattern here. Dina might be right. You know? <laughs> so anyways, it, it seems like to be a pattern. And then there's the ontogeny, like the age of the animal. And so that became the biggest hiccup, I think, was that shrews are so short lived. You could almost never get a repeated measure on one, uh, right? So, so the set, yeah, oh, that was, that was literally one of my big hiccups on this yeah. whole thing. I was like, I don't know, Dina, they're all, they're all different animals. And how do you know that's a sub adult and that's not an adult? And if I look at this, there's changes. Like even uh, Sigmund Freud had done all this stuff about like why Mickey Mouse had changed in design oh over God. time. <laughs> like there's a awesome it cool site. Deep, man. Well, for the younger audience, all the characters, cartoon characters, they all have big eyes and they're all rounded and big eyes and there's psychology behind that. Wow. Yeah. Everyone likes the what the filters when they put on their phone right. or they have cat eyes and stuff because it's a there's 
science behind why everyone goes oh over that yeah. so anyways so we know like over your age your, your skull and basically even humans your skull as a proportion of your body is highest at birth and yeah. it ever will be again as far as like our growth our heads grow reach their peak and stop faster than the rest okay. right so so anyway so you start looking at the age and the structure and all this stuff and I did everything I could to prove that it wasn't real. And oh, there it is again. <laughs> and so, so then Dina and Javier took it a step further and went and caught shrews. And this was like a Herculean task. Catch the shrews, put them in x-ray machines, like sedate Whoa, them, I think okay. with isofluorine. Little portable x-ray machine, get scanned, oh, release little it. little x-ray machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they did like a tremendous amount of work. I think we, we raised some in captivity. And I'm using we very loosely, but they, they had them in captivity and they put them through like these uh, cognitive maps to try to figure out if there's seasonality I saw that in that. paper. Yeah, and it, it's like crazy stuff. And I don't know, I um, it went, I, I believe it. I mean, I'm like, to the point where I believe it. Yeah. Am I remembering wow. correctly during the winter when their, their skulls were yeah. smaller, they had a harder time yeah. finding the food? Yeah. Right, because, and, and there's actually, let's like be really cool and remember I worked for Black Rock Forest because right? there's another research project happening here by Dmitry Aronoff, who's at Columbia University, who's doing similar work on chickadees. So chickadees have this amazing like spatial memory, right? So they go and they collect stuff and they cache it, like cache it all over the place. So he's been very interested in the cognitive abilities of these animals and this maze thing and why it's relevant to the winter is like if you're a bird like a seed caching bird or um shrews like shrews are insectivores right so generally generally speaking we think there's less as there's a caterpillar crawling on my leg <laughs> there's generally less insects that are out and available to be eaten so your brain being smaller almost your hippocampus i think was like 18 percent smaller in the winter which is what you use for your spatial memory like if that's now smaller at the time you need it the most like what the hell is going on yeah so that part i don't understand because that gets into like real biology that you know <laughs> i do ecology so i do a lot of numbers but um it, it is a, a weird thing and the cool part might be is uh if they can understand how shrews can shrink and then regrow ossified bone, not like squishy bone, but like right. the bone, the sutures Real in the bone. cranium have, have, are, are there. What does that mean for osteoporosis research, right? right? Wow. So like, here's an animal that, I mean, you know, it's, it's cool, it's small, it's little, it's a, uh, sorry, bugs in my socks. There we go. <laughs> They're a little um, weird today. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, so we, you never know. And I'd be super thrilled if some fluke of a project for me that derailed me for two years, which, you know, full confession, I love skull morphology. So I was also like, yeah, this is pretty cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, yeah, Dental's phenomenon, it, 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 I don't know, I'm a believer. It took, <laughs> it took four or five years, but I believe it. <laughs> and just to be clear, it's not just the skull, it's the, their brain too, right? Yeah, it's yeah. It's like soft tissue as yeah, well that's yeah, growing yeah, and shrinking. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't remember fully what's going on in the brain. I don't, I mean, again, I'll, you'll have to put a link to the paper or maybe another future podcast is with Dina, but like, I don't remember if it's a density question or mass or volume. I don't remember all the details anymore, but it's definitely the, the, the cranium is shrinking and the brain has to right right to make that space right because so, otherwise it's, i don't know <laughs> yeah otherwise, yeah exactly it already makes my brain hurt <laughs> it's it's yeah 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 so oh, it's wild whoa wow so and we think oh wow canada goose no no what is that that is a heron that's a great blue heron gbh great blue like heron a with call. a weird weird yeah. sound he's going through changes the going back. Uh, it sounded like a goose i was hoping it was a sandhill crane uh, <laughs> I, I in the forest <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so and and i think you mentioned this but i just wanted to make sure for the audience the we kind of think it's probably happening as a an energy saving mechanism because they're high energy animals that don't hibernate during the winter so yeah that's how i remember it i remember that was the hypothesis that we approach or at least i approached a lot of it was the like why like yeah. why, why would you do this and you know we know a lot of animals have a lot of different strategies yeah. you know they build up body fat they hibernate they go into torpor they migrate they do all these things but something that you know is a super active all year must be doing I'm just gonna get something <laughs> yeah you know it's like 
You know, and I, I, I think... a lot of people that do that to survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But is it seasonal? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right. Well, I think the the last thing we should talk about, because I think we have a couple more minutes, is we do have to ask your opinion. Do fish or scream? No. <laughs> Next question. Can wow. you say that again, please? <laughs> do fish or scream? No. <laughs> um, so yeah, good good question. So. Um, yeah, like you guys, I'm sure you've seen the videos or whatever online. Most of, and I'm, and I also say straight up, I don't spend all my time online trying to find these videos. But the ones that I've seen are almost always a fox. Fox, right? right? Yeah. And again, the fox, right? So it's probably all just because of fox. But, um, but it always comes back to foxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's all foxes. Yeah, <laughs> but. Fishers do make sounds for yeah. sure. And in fact, I, I remember as a, during my PhD, when you'd have one in a, in a trap, a cage, we use the big uh, hab hearts, right? And um, we built these wooden boxes around it so you, you can't like see what's in it until you get right up to it. And it's for a lot of other reasons. Anyways, they make like this like sound when they're in there, when they're stressed because they're stressed, right? It's in a cage, something's approaching and then they make this sound and it's I've never I've never had them like screech at me I've never had them make anything that sounds like a, a howl or anything like that it's always that chuffing sound I had one once that I had collared and it was in a basal cavity of a tree and it was snow so I was actually tracking it too and he was in there and he poked his head out like this and he made that same sound I wonder if we could find an audio of that somewhere plug it in maybe yeah we'll try we'll look I might know where there is one oh that'd be great uh, but I, two side notes, one on a Martin, so closely related animal, yeah. same situation, had it in a cage. It made terrible sounds to me, like, yeah. you know, like, like growling and screeching noises and, uh, you know, whatever. It was like, holy cow, what the hell is in there? Like when it's all covered up and you go to open a door, yeah. you're like, oh, you know, you yeah. literally jump back. Like, Whoa. All right. Oh, it's just a little Martin. All right. Take it easy, buddy. <laughs> um, and then in California, I worked out there for about a year and a half on another project and um they're they're you know petitioned to be endangered their their populations are going down for a bunch of reasons rodenticide poisoning all this other bad stuff so we had a situation there where a tree was dropped or the mother was killed or something i can't remember again this was forever ago but we ended up with one of the kits and we brought it in and tried to rehab it and then re-release it, which we were successful at. But we did this outdoor exclosure for it in the forest and we would have to feed it. So we would catch wood rats and feed her live prey to rehabilitate her. And when you would approach the structure to like feed her, she made all kinds of terrible sounding noises. Mm -hmm. And that's the only time I've ever heard a fisher be like wow that's kind of like what people have described right but i've never heard it elsewhere like on all these videos i've heard online and stuff it's almost always a red fox sometimes a bobcat and for sure if a fisher is getting attacked it'll make a sound like yeah. like yeah. if a rabbit's being eaten it makes a terrible sound yeah, yeah. right yeah. So, death cry. Yeah. Well, i yeah, just yeah, saw yeah. a yeah. video of our friend who's a rehabber and she was approaching a baby fisher that i don't know if the mother i think the mother was killed by a dog maybe something mm -hmm. like that Happens. and the baby fisher is making terrible sounds yeah i mean you saw the video was a fisher yeah. you know and, it's and like, wow after our, our last episode i had looked into it a little more because i had read an article where someone said they found a, a video of a fisher making screaming like sounds yeah and i did track down that video and it was a fisher that was being rehabbed and uh -huh. they said because they interviewed some of the staff in the video yeah. and they said that fisher hated being in uh -huh. an enclosure yeah and it was making these kind of screeching sounds yeah which sounded horrible, but did not did not sound like what you hear or what you yeah. hear from the videos posted online of people yeah. pointing at the woods and saying, "That's a fisher screaming." Yeah, fisher cat scream. screech, yeah. and you're yeah. like, "Fisher cat, like yeah. a fox." So yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I don't know. But as I tell everybody, and, and this conversation, also the folks that are like, "Fishers, they're nasty. Why do we, why do we want those?" <laughs> it's like most people's perception of a fisher is either remote, you know, that's a fisher cat screeching out there, 
or it's in confined space. Like the fur trapper who goes out with his GoPro and right. has a fisher in a trap and is doing all kinds of terrible things. I'm like, I'm Which you'd be you. doing if you were in a exactly. trap too. Exactly, I'm like, well, what would you do if I had you caught in the woods for 24 hours, you yeah. know, kind of thing like that. Or like, I put gray squirrels in cages for trapping and they sound nasty too, but <laughs> like, you know, but um, yeah, it's a A fisher typically going about its day is not going to probably no, be No, I, I don't think, yeah, I think, I had a fisher who was denning in a tree once and I did telemetry on her. She came out in the limb, made more noise by moving around than like alert calls or anything. She yeah. was not happy with me being at the base of her tree and she was just like kind of up and down, up and down and she was just not happy, but she never she like agitated. yelled at me, right. you know, yeah. Yeah, like get out of here. I remember you. <laughs> not this All guy right. again. Yeah. Well, we appreciate the so. definitive answer. Yeah, yeah, that, that hard no within like an asterisk. And well, it does sometimes make sense. Right. <laughs> well, there's very few hard answers. That's right. If anything about ecology. That's what yeah. we find all the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, we can't thank you enough. Yeah, this has been awesome. Yeah, this yeah. has been fun. It was great. Anytime. We love sharing your expertise. Sure. And I want to point people, I want to point the listeners to your website, oh. scottlapointe.weebly.com. Sure. Because um, I just... I had a great time going through the media you put up, the data oh. you put up, the list of papers you put up. Sure. Um, it's it's inter an interesting re read. We'll put a link into the episode notes. Thanks. I, I, I mean, I should go update that now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go check it out yet. Yeah. Well, by Here's the time, time we edit this. Yeah, yeah. you'll have a little All bit right, of time. Let me know. A window. Yeah. yeah. So is there is there anything else that you want to let the audience know, like about your uh, research or about Black Rock Forest here, anything like that? I mean, you gave us a lot of great information at the beginning. Yeah, so. I, I think, you know, Black Rock Forest, we're a nonprofit, so we're always looking for ways of generating income. So if people feel like throwing some change at a nonprofit, we'll take that. We do try to do research here. I am the person to reach out to if you wanted to come here and do research or you just have general questions about what we're doing up here. If I can't answer it, I can point you toward it. So right. we have a website, look us up. We are not the investment firm. <laughs> just put that full disclosure. You'll figure it out quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it a donation to the investment firm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so folks, support Black Rock Forest. And uh, I think Daniel and Steve would agree that because of our great supportive patrons, We'll be, we'll be happy to make a donation to Black Rock Forest Absolutely. and support yeah. the work you do here. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks, it's time for our wrap-up. We let Dr. LaPointe get back to his real work, but we want to thank him again for sharing his time with us. He really did a great job today. Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. So one thing we did forget to do was our ad break for Gumleaf Boots. So we want to give a shout out to Gumleaf USA. They have been a sponsor of the podcast for a long time. They provided boots to Steve and myself, and hopefully they're going to do it for Daniel soon. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but Gumleaf provides high quality, tall rubber boots, boots that might cost a little more, but they're going to last a whole lot longer. They can bend over a million times without cracking. Steve and I use ours a lot, and we can't recommend them enough. And Gumleaf has been kind enough to give patrons of the podcast free shipping on any Gumleaf order. So check out gumleafusa.com. All right, so we want to give a shout out right now to Mark V, one of our listeners. He sent an email to us where he was talking about fisher sightings that he had in our neck of the woods in western New York and two videos of a mother fisher that it seemed like she was agitated that Mark had been near her tree. So I at first thought it might be a mink, but Daniel looked it over and he said, no, 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 it was a fisher. Why do you think you knew it was a fisher? Uh, just it looked a lot bigger uh, than a mink. The head looked larger proportionately. The way it was just kind of bounding around through the forest. And that long tail. Um, that long bushy tail. Yeah. And the way it climbed a tree. I mean, I know that minks can, but that's more indicative of fisher behavior. Yeah. So. All right. So now we'd like to thank our growing list of Patreon supporters. So thank you to our new patrons, Picasso3, Jen D, and Mark T. We also like to give a special shout out each month to our top patrons. So stick around for the end of the episode to hear Bill's daughter Violet share that list. And remember, if you'd like to be a part of the Field Guides and read our patron list in the future episodes, email us at thefieldguides at gmail.com. 
And if you'd like to support the podcast, consider becoming a patron of our show at patreon.com. As a patron, you'll get access to a special patrons-only version of our episodes that include Bill sharing the episode notes. Because of our support from our listeners, we have been able to keep the show free and make cooler episodes like this one. Or you can make a one-time donation through PayPal on our website. And don't forget that we also have Field Guides merch available through our website store at thefieldguidespodcast.com. And also remember that if you can't financially support the podcast, you can help out by sharing it with friends and family and by subscribing and leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. It helps spread the word and allows us to reach a wider audience. So we'd like to thank our newest iTunes reviewer, Greenfield05. Come enjoy our sporadic posts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can always email us ideas for episode topics, criticisms, or your stories of encounters with foxes. It always comes back to foxes. (laughs) To thefieldguides at gmail.com. And parents, remember, get those kids outside. Let them get muddy, let them get dirty, let them flip over rocks and logs. And if you don't have kids, please make some time to get yourselves outside. All right, folks, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. And here is Violet with this month's top patrons. Eric, Alyssa, Adam, the Hebranks, Mary, Sung, Dr. Judy, Kimberly B., Peter R., Callie, Rich K., Jessica D., Orange Julianne, Daniel M. Diane. We named the dog Indy. Hot dog, cold weather. Dwayne H. Jennifer D. Jonathan A. Picazzo 3. Mark S. Cecilia. Julie B. Dennis. Leslie H. Chris N. Jeff S. Colin G. Brant. Jonathan K. Matt E. Plants in My Pants. Sean M. Ryan R. Sophie S. Connor H. Measure in Principle, Fregaria Pefaloinoidea, Outside Chronicles, Andrew C., Quixote, Max D., Melissa Marie in Dusty, Arizona, Kelly S., Sarah S., Helen A., Judy F., Ben C., Jane H., Doodle Dude 82, Gail and Mac, Kazzies, Esther C., John W., Mark V., Bethany H., Rob M., Hannah M. There's a lot, huh? <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and folks, on behalf of Daniel and Steve, thank you so much for your support. It allows us to keep the podcast free. And as I always say, it means the world to us. So thank you, Violet. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you, patrons. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. We got a mountain biker coming by, folks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wow. Watch out for our ring neck snake down there. <laughs> He's still on the right side. There's about 50 goldfish off of that hillside. I don't yeah, yeah. it's a popular spot for them. Oh my him. gosh, yeah, oh, nice. they're all over yeah. the place. <laughs> oh, Very sorry, nice. Boy. Oh, it's okay, you're fine. No you're worries. fine. <laughs> we'll just cut you out. <laughs> <laughs> on the cutting room floor. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Stay Pizza. cool.